Welcome to Behind the Business. I'm Joey Sinitzi and I'm alongside co-founder Dylan Chouette. And we're kind of revamping this podcast. So we're going to have two segments now. So the original one, Behind the Underdogs, where we interview athletes uh, to have them share their story and obviously give valuable insights to the listeners. We're taking a new approach, so we're still going to have that segment. But the Behind the Business segment is going to be more focused on the behind the scenes, what we're doing on a day to day and stories about how we're really getting this thing off the ground. Uh, God knows, Dylan knows, I know that we've had quite the journey so far. I know there's a lot more to come, but I think a lot of these stories, especially if you guys are interested in starting your own business, can be can be valuable. And so we're going to take it all the way back and we'll be brief with it from 2019 to 2021 because there's a lot going on in there. But taking it back to when we started in 2019, August 1st, 2019 is when we launched and initially it was just the clothing and I had been working on launching the store since February of 2019. So it was about, you know, that spring into summer uh, spent on, you know, working, building up capital to buy some clothes and get a shoot going and kind of going winging it. I had started numerous clothing brands since I was 13 years old and three of them went nowhere. And I had a basis to stand on because I knew what wasn't working. I knew I had to have a better product, a better mission and building a brand instead of just a product. So that was the approach that I was taking. And obviously throughout high school, it was like, you know, being a hockey player, a serious athlete that wanted to take to the next level and, and play in juniors and play in college. Uh, it was hard to find like-minded individuals. So that was where the whole thing stemmed from, you know, the underdog brand and culminating a community of like-minded individuals. That was the goal from the start. And that was the idea behind the clothing to have people wearing it on their sleeve, like being proud of being a part of the community. So that's where we started. And, uh, you know, it was, it was funny in the beginning cause I really didn't know what to expect from it. And I had struggled initially really trying to figure out how to make sales. And I remember when the first sale came in, the first day we made $600, which was awesome, but it was mostly family and friends. <laughs> like, you know, people who were all around, I was like, this is crazy. Like we make $600 a day. We're going to have X, Y, Z dollars by this day. And it's funny because like, <laughs> that's how you think, especially when you have the big days, it's like, man, if this happened every day, we'd be, we'd have a ton of money, you know? And yeah. I think that was like my first realization that like, it's a lot harder than that. It, it takes, takes time. To, to build loyal customers and people coming back for more. And clothing is one of those things where it's, it lasts long, right? Like a t-shirt can last you years. Uh, a tank top can last you years. Shorts can last you years. So that was like my first realization of, okay, first of all, there's hundreds of thousands of clothing brands out there. And what are the chances that we can actually be niche with clothing brand it's slim it's it's especially harder to do now i mean gym shark was really the trailblazer in, in that space so we wanted to you know try to take it a different way so obviously 2019 we had the clothing and then i was like starting to play around with you know dylan came on board shortly after that i mean literally the end of august beginning of september we we uh met playing junior hockey in attleboro mass and uh basically we started working on the next step from there and I remember the day where I brought it up to you in the, in the gym where I was like, what if we did a podcast? Like, is that, you know, something you'd be interested in? And, uh, and then the brainstorming really started from there. And I think, you know, if looking back then to say that we'd have the episodes that we have now from behind the underdogs, I probably wouldn't really believe it as with anything else that we have going on right now. Um, no kidding, but that was, yeah, like that was really the next step in, in that process, uh, was the podcast and, and, you know, really expanding on the community side of it. Like we wanted to interview people that have been there, done that, not just for the listeners, but for, for our sake too, you know, I mean, how many, mm -hmm. Oh, we learned so much done? doing we that as well. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. And like, hell, I remember even that, that first year, like recording episodes in Rebecca's basement, like at my billets, Rebecca, like. That was, yeah, that was kind of the start of it. And we started that, what, mid, I guess it would have been closing in on 2020 at that point. Yeah, I think 2020 was when we, when we started it, yeah. 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 And then, yeah, fast forward, I mean, we had the podcast going that, that whole next season um, of 2020, 2021, hockey season. But yeah, that was kind of the first thing that we did together and started to grow. And I, I'm, I wish we could have stayed, I mean, obviously looking at the buzz pro yesterday with you, like 
there was growth. Like we saw the growth. It was just a matter of like making it a priority. It was one, it's tough to find guests to continually do that. And I think that's why we wanted to start a segment where it can just be us, um, which is what we're doing now, but we saw it. And then it just became so difficult to do with hockey. And then all of a sudden school on top of that. Um, But that was the start of like something cool and something that we hope to be able to do more full time and have more you know, more of our time spent on in the future. I remember the first episode that we did with Cam Dumani. Oh yeah. And yeah. every, probably, for, I would say probably for the first five episodes that we did, I'd be in a full sweat by the end of it. <laughs> I I had never interviewed anybody before. I had no idea what I was doing. And I think that's just a testament of literally just going, just doing it, just figure it out as you go. Neither of us like, did. It's literally what we've done every step of the process so far. And there's always a new thing, like even today, right? Four or five years later, where there's always a next level that we've never experienced yet. And it's just adaptability. You look and at it right now. Yeah, exactly. Like we got the biggest moment coming up with the launch in Hanford. It's like, yeah, we don't know what to expect. We don't know what we're getting ourselves into. Now we're working with two real distributors and Hanford. It's like, it's kind of a double whammy, like all in one happening at yeah. the same time. Like, and we're just, We'll figure it out as we go. Exactly. Exactly. And so I guess from there, you know, we get to the end of juniors, um, you know, on the business side of things, when we got to the end of juniors, I ended up going to Skidmore and that was when things really went on a hiatus, a temporary hiatus for a little while, while we kind of figured out the next steps and going back to what I was saying, like clothing, it's one of those things where it's tough to bring in consistent revenue from loyal customers because you know, you need the the capital to continually come out with new products that they're like, I'm going to buy that, you know, whereas if you have uh, a repurchasable, a consumable item that people can get on board with, that's where the revenue can come in to play. And that's where the opportunities with retail accounts, like we've seen this year in Hannaford's, like that's where you can take those big steps. And I think that was the concept, you know, in that, that first idea phase of where we can take this next. And obviously I think the biggest obstacle was how the hell are we going to come up with the money to start something like this. I mean, from the start, we were always like, let's, we want to get into the supplement space. Like that's where we want to go. And during juniors, I don't think I thought we were that close being a year, two years later where we'd actually bring a product to market. Um, But that was a tough time. Uh, You know, when we first came up with the ideas and, you know, we get a business plan. We started working on the business plan, which is now 57 pages long and it's a legit business plan. Same thing with the pitch deck. And my God, we spent probably weeks doing that thing. Like legit, the time of two weeks is probably how long we spent hours wise on that freaking business plan. Um, but some of the ideas, man, that we came up with in the beginning, it's great. I, lo- I honestly love that stage of things where it's just like, the idea phase. What what are we going to do? What market can we tackle? Like looking back now, I loved working on that business plan because it was so cool being like, we're crafting this product for a specific demographic, a specific market, which is obviously, you know, the college athlete. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of the ideas that we, we had in the early days and one that we were going to run with, I think that we started to go some designs yeah. made we we're going to name it relentless relent was it relentless pre-workout or relentless yeah energy something like that no and... i think it was relentless pre-workout yeah yeah relentless pre-workout and we started with the powdered pre-workout we were like we got some samples for for that uh from some i don't even remember what i think it was NutriCap or something like that yeah and but we kind of ran into the that same was issue. during our last year yeah like I oh mean, yeah we had all was. the crazy ideas I- during our last year of juniors, but I remember bringing that sample in for the boys. Like Ricky tried it. Yep. Um, and it was strawberry lemonade. Like that's what we did or pink lemonade. Like that, that idea stayed with it. Um, I mean, we had all the different ideas of yep. the pre-workout, like, which we, I'll let you get into that. But yeah, that was during, like that was during the, that would have been about February of 2021. We yep. had our first sample already of the powder and God, I remember the bus trips, like in a, working on a Google Doc on a hotspot, probably heading to Johnstown or freaking Maryland, <laughs> sitting in the back of the bus, working on like the formulation. Like I remember doing that. Okay, we want this ingredient. Like we want it sourced from this company. 
we want this one to be the patented form. Uh, you know, we want it at, at X amount. Like I remember doing all that on a Google doc in the back of the bus in juniors. Like that was, yeah. those are the, the beginning stages of it and to what ultimately turned into UD energy today. Yeah. And I think, you know, the reason why we didn't end up going with that is it wasn't unique enough. And it's like the same mm -hmm. thing with the clothing side of things. It's just how many freaking parts There's a million pre-workouts out there. And that's why we're like, all right, what, what can we do here? How can we make this unique? And that's when the crazy ideas really started to, to come into play, which is interesting. I, well, first let me say the idea and then let me tell you what's interesting about it. So the idea initially was like, maybe, maybe we'll do a dry scoop. Everybody was dry scooping at the time. It was like a fad for the time. It felt like I, everybody I knew was, was dry scoop and pre-workout. And we were like, what if we could make, make one that was like, um, you know, soluble when you, when you dry scoop, because that was the biggest thing was like, if you breathe, when you dry scoop or choking done. on it, <laughs> yeah. you're done, you know, like yeah, it was yeah. too much of a risk to yeah. like, Oh, someone's going to do this. We're going to go to jail. We're going to choke <laughs> that, on it. Yeah. And that was when the pixie stick idea came into play. We were like, what if we could make something like a pixie stick? And then we were like, well, our freaking scoop is what, what was it? 30, 30 grams or something? Uh, originally it was just south of 30 grams i want to say it was like 28 yeah. and a half grams was our which is a example. that is a big scoop that's a heaping scoop. the size of a protein <laughs> scoop yeah yeah legit a protein scoop um and so we we're like yeah you know what if we made it we wanted to make it more like scientific and more transparent and like this was a potent formulation that is going to be effective and beneficial for athletes. So we, we were thinking and that's about, how it really started too, was like, yeah. we wanted it fully dosed. We didn't want to be yeah. like every other brand that had like, you know, two grams of citrulline and a hundred milligrams. Like we wanted everything to be fully loaded. Like that's why it was so big. Something. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then from there, the idea, you know, we ran with that pixie stick idea for a while. And we we're like, what if we put it in like the shape of a test tube and to make it more like scientific looking, um, mm -hmm. and then we were like, how the hell would we make this work? This, you know, what this probably, I don't remember the exact reason why we didn't end up going with it, but obviously we started to think more of realistic, um, expectations of what we could bring to market. And I think that's where we saw the opportunity in the healthy energy drink space and, you know, the formulations that were out there, they lacked full transparency, you know, with proprietary blends and artificial ingredients and additives and all that kind of stuff, which we've has really start to to hit the research now um more and more research is coming out i feel like on a monthly basis about you know the negative effects long term for artificial ingredients like sucralose ask um and i think it's going to continue in that direction but you know looking back i remember when we were doing the business plan and we we're like healthy energy drink you know you're thinking we you got what at the time it was like life aid uh celsius was really just starting to to grow at that point mm -hmm. i believe and uh what else did we have at that time it was like life aid uh bucked up i think was around then as well yeah their pre-workout was around um as far as like i mean it was just your staple entered like your traditional big players red bull monster yep. you know that sort of thing well yeah but there yeah. wasn't this like niche of drinks similar to celsius like there is today mm. i mean you know look at ghost ghost was nowhere near where they are now when we started doing this yeah um i mean there's, there's so many of them out now and i you know it's one of those things okay maybe because we were paying more attention to it we started to notice it more but when we started planning for the idea of a ready to drink and putting it in a can it seemed like there was a new energy drink coming out every week yeah yeah to what seemed like a totally untapped market when we first started. Right. Yeah. And I think that was the case because fast forward to today and all the big name brands are starting to either one buy out existing healthy energy drink brands. I mean, look at Celsius, they're a prime example with, with Pepsi buying them or, or mm -hmm. investing $500 million, 550, whatever it was. Um, and that's, it's funny because I'm reading a book right now and it's harder for bigger brands and companies to transition their their mission and make tweaks to that so they just buy existing companies that are that are succeeding in the marketplace and then they start coming out like you know rockstar's got their healthier one red bull's got their sugar free you know all that kind of kind of stuff um yeah. but now like i turn over every single energy drink when i see them and the more that i see and i know it's the same for you because we talk about it all the time um but 
you know, you, you have drink brands that are saying like natural flavors and colors, but they're still using artificial sweeteners. You know what I mean? So they're mm -hmm. trying to deem themselves, uh, you know, a, a natural drink, but it's just not the truth. Yeah. So I, everybody that's listening, I challenge you guys to try and find an energy drink that doesn't have sucralose, doesn't have ASK, and is actually naturally flavored, naturally sweetened, and has natural colors. It's rare to find. I, there's probably a handful at most of ones that you would see in a store. Um, and, uh, you know, that's obviously the, the approach that we wanted to take. And um, that whole process, obviously, I think in the beginning, when we were making the business plan. It was like, we're really doing this business plan with no idea of how we would raise capital. We just knew that the best way to potentially get investors and to raise money was to have a significant business plan that can convey our, our mission and what we're trying to achieve with our product. And when you really think about it, we went niche with it and, you know, focus on the college athletes. I mean, that's why we have 249 milligrams of caffeine in, in the product, which I still think that we can, we can capitalize on um, in the market and, and get more awareness to the college athletes because it's an underserved market. You know, Celsius is banned. Mm -hmm. There are numerous other energy drinks that are banned for the ingredients that they have. And we're slowly taking these steps, right? Like we launched the college athlete program. We have over 250 athletes now in the college athlete program. We're informed sports certified. Like all those things are in the goal of bringing more eyes from the college athlete demographic because that's what this product is ultimately for and then you know obviously it's beneficial for any fitness go or any athlete um but you know that was our our goal from the product and you know the investment side of things i remember when we were making the business plan it's like this is great we're spending so much time on it but how the hell are we going to raise money to do this and you know i remember we we thought we had it we thought we had it in the bag we're like we're, we got our hundred thousand our hundred thousand dollars was our goal uh, to raise money to, to get this thing off the, off the ground. And, you know, we had somebody say that they were going to make it happen a hundred thousand dollars. And we were like, holy shit, like this is going to happen. This is, this is real. And it ended up not working out. And we were kind of back to square one with just a business plan. And, um, you know, from there it was basically trying to find, find small micro investors, um, and, you know, we ended up getting, uh, having 11 total investors, uh, to date, you know, raising enough money to not just get one flavor off the ground, but two flavors off the ground. And, uh, obviously it's gotten to gotten us to where we are today. And, um, you know, but the business plan phase was, was very interesting. And I, I, I find looking back now was, was a fun aspect of it because it was late nights working on that thing but i think it really set us up and, and allowed us to, to get us to where we are now you know and it was continually like constantly evolving too like i remember yeah. even which we'll talk about in the next episode but like the trip to la when we first went out to officially like flavor ud when we knew it was going to be in a can at this point you know that was the spring of our freshman year and i remember that spring like spending nights in the dorm study room working on that thing like hours mm -hmm. on that thing and this was when we already had the product like that was well behind us we knew what we were putting in it all the amounts like all the little minute details like that this was like the big picture like planning for this thing okay where what's what's our future going to look like like what's our timeline and I mean, yeah, we put hours into that thing and it was just constantly evolving and refining. Um, but like you say, I think it, it became a bit of a running joke. It was like, oh, like live plan, like we got to open that thing up again because we knew like the time commitment that had gone into that thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, there were times that we totally reconstructed the financial projections in live plan, which arguably took the most amount of time out of all of it. Um, yeah. But, you know... I think that whole process of us raising money to get us off the ground was very difficult, but it was also just like a, a taste of the obstacles that we had ahead. There's, I think that's like a common misconception is like, oh, once you have the money, it's like, you're good to go, you know, but we've had so many challenges between then and now that we've had to overcome. And I think in the beginning, it was like this, not delusional belief. But, you know, 
a confidence that we had that we were going to make it happen regardless. We were going to find a way to, to do it, you know, however that might be. And, um, I think that's why so many businesses fail too in, in the early stages because they can't get a product off the ground because that's arguably where most of the obstacles are. I don't know how you feel, but I felt like once we got the original funding to make this happen, to launch UD, to make our first production happen, all the ingredients, cans, everything involved with the first run, it was like, okay, like, you know, we made it over the hill. And then we got over that hill to find out that there was a much bigger hill. And I'm sure when we make it over this next hill, there's a bigger one on the other side, like raising funding. That's one thing that we've learned too from others. Uh, it doesn't go away. You're always trying to raise capital um, in order to grow. So I think, yeah, you said that exactly right. Like that was just a little tasting of what we were really getting ourselves into um, as far as raising capital. Like, I mean, look at the DECA commitment, um, mm -hmm. you know, what we're dealing with now, getting the third flavor out, working on the third flavor, making sure we have capital for a successful launch into retail, expanding into the Midwest for the salesman. Like there's always going to be capital that's required in order to grow in order to grow. And you know, it's not going to go away. Yeah. But I do think of, you know, when we started, we had zero network, we were very little mm -hmm. network, I should say, because the investors we got were because of our network that we had. But yeah. it makes me think of what Alex Ramosi said. And he was talking about in the beginning, like you're fighting a bear with sticks and stones. And if you can get past that stage, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily get easier. The challenges get bigger and the obstacles get bigger, but you're fighting a dragon with an army of people. You know what I mean? You have more resource resources and a network mm -hmm. to work with yeah. to be able to, to make it work. And that's always stuck with me ever since I heard that. And I, I heard it sometime this year. I don't remember when it was, but it's true. It's totally true. And if you think about the obstacles we're facing now, imagine if we had those on the first day, we wouldn't know how to handle them. We, we wouldn't have the resources to be able to do it either. Yeah. Once, once we decided that cans were what we were going to do, and I'd say, you know, at what point, at what point do you feel we had the can idea totally set in stone? Like, okay, this is what we're doing. We're going with a ready to drink, a 12 ounce can. Um, cause I remember like even into school, we, we weren't totally set on that. Like we were still debating on a 16 ounce can or a 12 ounce can. And you know, th that was freshman year. So that was the fall of 21. And, you know, come spring of 22, that was when we headed out to LA to formulate, to officially yeah. formulate, like they had everything at that point. We had paid our, our $10,000 um, fee to essentially create the product and get a formula down. But it was still working up into that year, that freshman year of, okay, you know, yeah. are we going to do a 12 ounce can, a 16 ounce can? I think we had decided on a can. Um, but I remember even like looking at something like what BioSteel does, but we wanted to do a can like that. We were, we were set yeah. on that. Um, which I think even looking back at it now, it has its pros and its cons. Like the resealable aspect of BioSteel yeah. is nice, but like, I still feel like the can's authentic. It's cool. It's something different than, you know, yeah. Like the BioSteel or body armor in a bottle, same with Gatorade, yeah. you know, like we wanted to be that sporty drink and associated with athletes, but do something different. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, all is well, you get an idea in place, you know, you get your business plan, you figure out what you're looking to bring to market. And then it's like, okay, now the work begins. It's like, you got to find a co-packer. You got to find where you're sourcing your ingredients from a can producer, all those sorts of things were the next steps for us. Um, you know, that was when we, we found our beverage formulators out in Los Angeles and we began working with them um and we're going to cover that on the next episode is there anything else you want to go over or that i missed no nope. Every, everything we can cover but i guess uh, we'll touch briefly how we got in in contact with power brands i mean originally they were going to produce for us and that's how we discovered them because we we're like okay we have a formula we know what we want to do who's going to produce this or how are we going to produce it and we started reaching out to all sorts of can manufacturers and beverage producers that were capable of you know filling cans and power brands was one we stumbled across and i just remember their slogan it was uh like from idea to shelf in 90 days it, was some, it wasn't exactly yeah. that it was something like that and as we learned 
It took a lot longer than 90 days. But uh, that's besides the point. But originally they were going to produce for us and ultimately they were just the beverage formulators, which, I mean, I don't know any other co-packers that are also doing the formulation side of things. Um, obviously, we, we were in contact with that one in St. Louis, the um, brothers, I forget, but it, yeah, they yeah. were more expensive. And that was later. But Power Brands was great for us to be to begin with, um, formulated everything. And then that was when they were going through the buyout with their co-packing facility because originally that's what we were going to do and we ended up finding something closer back east, which it all ended up working out. Um, but it was kind of just a shot in the dark how we got in touch with Power Brands. We just reached out cold yeah. uh, after coming across them on online. Um, yeah. And that ultimately led to us heading out there for our first real business trip, which we can discuss on the next one. Which was a really cool experience, but also um, a very eye-opening experience, I think, because we realized how much work was ahead. But we'll we'll make sure that we, uh, you know, we're going to cover that in depth on the next one. We're going to try and release one of these every week. Uh, it'll be 20 to 30 minutes long. Uh, we'd really appreciate it if you guys can, you know, leave a review on whatever streaming platform you got. Um, it's a huge help for us. And obviously, you know, we just want to share these stories that, that we have. And also we have a good time doing it, uh, you know, it brings back good memories. And it's also, um, you know, a good, uh, a good way to give some value back to, to you guys and, and, you know, something to look forward to if you guys want to go down this road. So we'll see you guys on the next, next episode. 